Say hi. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the stamp chat. <laughs> I'm glad that you're joining me to talk about forgers and forgeries. Um, so I titled this, um, I always have trouble with titles. I titled this presentation um, US stamp, fake US stamps and the forgers who made them. Um, it's ha it has a bit of a bigger scope than that. It's not just US fakes, but because US fakes are my specialty. Um, I didn't want people to come in and expect um, a lot from outside of the United States. Um, but we, well, this is a presentation. I didn't even introduce you, Casey. <laughs> I <didn't> even... oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so excited. I this know. is one of my favorite talks. Believe me, I'm so excited too. But, but, but hold on, let me give you a drum roll. So thanks everybody for joining us on live stamp chat. It's so great to see you on our Wednesday edition. We are very pleased to have Casey Jo White of Philately Things. She is, you know, really got a great reputation among the philatelic community. She's vibrant, enthusiastic, knowledgeable in so many different avenues of the, I almost said the sport, but the hobby. And so we're really tickled when she gives us her time and attention. And I hope that you have checked out her YouTube playlist. We, uh, we kicked off a YouTube influencer kick, uh, playlist takeover and um, Casey joe has been the first. And so do be sure to go over to APS YouTube and check out her 11 favorite philatelic vids. Um, welcome again. Thank you so much for your membership to the APS. And if you're not a member, I, I do suggest that you check out stamps.org and see what we're all about. Right now, the library is up and available to non-members, so you'll want to have a look at that. And if you like what you see, perhaps you'll consider adopting a book that's leaving a legacy to our library and leaving a legacy of yours. You know, you put a nice nameplate in that book, that one that changed your course. So uh, we appreciate that. We'll have references from Mr. Scott Tiffany that uh, correlate with CJ's talk at the end of this during our Q&A. But uh, on that note, I want to thank everybody from coming near and far and uh, happy to have you on this hump day. And I'm going to give it over to CJ. Thank you. All right. Um, this is a talk mostly about um, the forgers who made the stamps, because I think that there's a lot of interesting history when you think about why people <clears throat> made forgeries. Um, and there are some incredibly interesting and drama filled stories in the world of forgeries. So I'll get right to it. There you go. Perfect. All right. So. Uh, enjoying and collecting fakes and forgeries, the history of fake stamps and the forgeries who created them. Um, this presentation kind of focuses on US, local, US stamps and local posts um, because that's a particular interest of mine. So why collect fakes and forgeries? Forgeries add interest and depth to your collection. They're interesting to look at. You've got good forgeries that show the impressive skill of a forger like um, Jean D. Sparati, um, is incredibly accurate and detailed. And then you have bad forgeries that take some creative artistic liberties and are kind of interesting to look at as well and to sometimes think how could this ever pass as a real stamp. Another reason to collect forgeries is to build your own forgery reference collection. Um, of course, if you send in something to be expertized, um, they will have a collection of, a reference collection of forgeries to compare to, but if forgeries are cheap, you could just build your own and then check your stamps against them. And uh, practice identifying forgeries. And practice identifying um, it, see if you can figure out which forgeries were, forgeries were made by which specific forger. 
And finally, to fill album spaces. Now, this was one of the original reason that forgeries were collect were created was that in the 1860s, as stamp collecting became really popular and stamp albums were being published, people wanted to fill those album spaces. And if they didn't have the stamp, they would buy a forgery as a placeholder um, to kind of fill that space until they could get as a, a real one. But for you, you might want to, in case like if you have a rare stamp, you're prob you are probably never going to get a Hawaiian missionary. But you could get a fake of a Hawaiian missionary. And you can put that in to kind of demonstrate this is what it would have looked like if you are trying to get that whole history in there. And because forgeries tell good stories, and again, I am going to be talking about some great forger stories in this presentation. Forgeries are important to postal history. Some of the first stamp catalogs, albums, and magazines were created by stamp forgers. Um, so we can think of the Scott standard postage catalog. Scott made the similes and reprints um, that would be considered forgeries today. But as he made those, people went out and, and got them. Um, it spread the word about stamp collecting as a growing hobby. Um, and it, it provided inspiration to early stamp collectors to think, oh, I want this. Um, and they also, these forgers, a lot of them published a lot of detailed research. Um, and they usually published philatelic magazines in order to sell their fakes. They would have a journal and they would have stamp news and then next to that advertisement for their fakes. Um, but making those journals and putting in that stamp news, now we have a record of those days. And bogus stamps, um, bogus is a term for stamps that were never issued. Um, they, they're not based on a real stamp. A forger just completely made them out of their mind. But a lot of these bogus stamps were based on real mail delivery services. And that gives us an insight to postal history and how mail was carried in the past. Um, the example I'm showing here is uh, Lathrop's Albany Bank Express. And I did a bunch of research on this. For a long time, it was considered something wholly made up. And while the stamps are fake, Lathrop's Albany Bank Express was a real um, service. It was a real company that existed and that carried packages between banks. So these fakes keep the memory of these companies alive for future researchers. Um, I never would have looked up the history of Albany Bank Express because if I didn't have this bogus stamp to research. So the forgers had a huge impact on philately, but it's a complicated relationship. So forgers are bad because they tricked collectors, um, selling things that they claimed were one thing and not. They flooded the market with these fakes. Um, at one point, there was just so many uh, fakes of certain stamps that people just didn't buy even real ones of that stamp because it was too risky. And they damaged trust between dealers and collectors because if a dealer purposely sold a fake or accidentally sold a fake, um, collectors might not be as willing to go to dealers and buy stamps. So those are all very bad things, but they also created early catalogs. They inspired collectors to join the hobby and they've preserved history in a way. So whether or not you think forgeries are good or bad, 
it depends on how you weigh the importance of these things. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm one who enjoys forgeries, and I kind of weigh a little heavier on the, the it's kind of good side, and that's why I encourage people to collect forgeries. Um, a brief history of some famous forgers and tips to identify their work. In Disparati. So we're going to start with one of the most famous stamp forgers, which is Jean Disparati. Uh, Disparati's forgeries are popular with collectors um, because even though they are forgeries, they can sell for hundreds up to thousands of dollars. Um, some of his forgeries are even worth more now than the stamps that he forged. Um, and because they're one of the reasons that they're so popular is because they're so well made, they can be hard to identify and they're kind of an artwork on their own. Um, sometimes he would work for days or weeks on a single stamp. Um, he had amazing craftsmanship. Um, before he was discovered as a stamp forger, many of his stamps, his fakes, he would send them to experts and they would certify them as real. But today the easiest way to identify his forgeries are by markings that he applied himself or were applied by the British Philatelic Library. Um, but if they do not have those markings, you, there is a book, uh, The Work of John, John Disparati, um, that has details on that. So he was born in Italy as Giovanni de Sparati in 1884. Uh, he had an interest in stamp collecting as a child. He enjoyed the hobby, but wasn't particularly fond of stamp dealers and expertizers. Um, supposedly as a kid, he saved up his money to buy a very expensive stamp. He discovered it was a forgery and he became bitter toward the dealer that sold it to him. Uh, he was well-educated on printing processes by various family members who were employed in the businesses of printing, photography, and paper mills. He was probably most influenced by his two brothers who were a photographer and a stamp dealer. And while he was still living in Italy, he probably worked with the Italian forger Erasmo on Oneglia. I, I'm so sorry, I cannot pronounce Italian names. Um, but that forger probably sold some of his first forgeries, um, which were stamps of San Marino. Um, and Desperati said that he made these for his brother, who was a collector and wanted the, these stamps for his collection. He took the name um, Jean or Jean. How would you pronounce that? Jean, um, when he moved to France, where he lived most of his life. And he began creating his philatelic works of art, first as a hobby and then as a side business. Um, he built his personal collection, which he called his Livre d'Or, or Gold Book. And it had over a hundred different forgeries that were all expertized and found genuine, including some that were approved by multiple expertizers. So he first came to public attention in 1942 when he was taken to the court for violating customs laws. He was shipping forgeries to a Portuguese stamp dealer and the French customs confiscated the package and arrested him for exporting valuables without a license. At which point he said that no, those laws against valuables don't apply because these aren't valuables, they are fake. They are artistic works, but the court, the experts didn't believe him. They took him to court. They brought in experts and the exports, experts at the court case said, no, these are real. Um, they're not fake. So he yeah. had to prove his innocence by creating new copies as evidence to show that he could do it. The case was settled in 1948, uh, but he was arrested for fraud. Uh, the word got out. Um, to stamp dealers and collectors who were deceived by his copies, and they sued him, and he was found guilty for fraud. 
but because he was so old at the time, he was given a small sentence. So in 1954, the British Philatelic Association purchased all of Desperati's stock, as well as his dyes, printing material, and records. They paid a very large sum for the collection, but included in the deal was a promise that Desperati would stop producing forgeries. But it's known that Desperati continued to make forgeries just for fun after the sale. The BPA um, marked the Desperati forgeries that they acquired as fakes, and the collection was used to better understand and identify his forgeries that were still in circulation. And they published two books written by Desperati. First was called uh, Le Philately Sans Experts, or Philately Without Experts, and La Technique Complete de la Philatelie de Art, The Complete Technique of Philatelic Art. Most of Desperati's forgeries are now marked in some way. Uh, many of the forgeries and proofs that are on the market now are actually signed copies, and there are books that are available to identify his work. Next, we're going to go from a very, very good forger to a not so great forger and a more modern one. This is Peter Winter. Uh, he was a modern stamp forger who was born and lived in Bremen, Germany. He was uh, trained as an opera singer. I have no idea if he was successful, but I do know that supposedly he was an opera singer. Uh, he created stamp reproductions in the 1980s. And he marketed these forgeries under the name Profil Forum, and later he sold his works to a firm called House of Stamps, which he had partial ownership of. He used photolithography to create his forgeries, which he claimed were just replicas. Um, he only made forgeries of the most expensive or famous stamps, such as Hawaiian missionaries and inverted jennies. And he sometimes created fake covers using his replicas, but these covers were often just a little off with inconsistent dates or combination usages because he didn't seem to have an especially great or perfect knowledge of postal history. In 1988, the British Library in London filed a copyright claim against him. Um, some of his photolithography work was made from the high quality photos that he borrowed from the library under false pretenses. The case was settled out of court, but it resulted in Winter having to give up all the dyes made with those photos, as well as all the stock created with those dyes. Supposedly, and maybe Heidi can look into this, uh, he attempted to secure a similar deal to what Desperati arranged with the American Philatelic Society. Uh, he offered all his stock and he promised to stop making forgeries um, if they'd pay him a million dollars. Um, but they declined his offer. His stamps were most often made for photolithography, and they can be identified because they look flat in appearance. They don't have those raised edges um, that the real engraved stamps would have. You can kind of just look at them and they look modern. Um, they're printed on clean paper, um, clean modern paper, and some of the copies are hand stamped with replic or faux. The Simf brothers. Simf brothers were printers from Leipzig, Germany. Uh, the younger brother was Emil Louis Richardson, and the older brother was Wilhelm August Louis Simf. Richards started publishing materials for stamp collectors. Uh, but he published his first listing of stamp prices in 1872, and in 1874, he published a stamp journal titled Illustrious Briefmarken Journal. In 1880, the brothers went into business together, co-owning the journal as Grabruder Synth. The Illustrious Briefmarken Journal included colored facsimiles of current stamps, but these similes were often cut out and used by collectors to fill album spaces of hard to acquire stamps. So noticing the popularity with collectors that were cutting out these um, illustrations, in addition to dealing stamps, they sold their facsimiles as art supplements. 
Uh, these facsimiles were high quality and steel engraved, but and they were very accurate to the original stamp designs, but they had no intention to deceive collectors. And in fact, they took measures to identify their work, um, such as engraving markings into the stamp design. If you look at this um, image here, you can see that they have put falch in the base of the statue, and that's directly engraved, engraved into the die, so all of these copies have it. But that didn't stop stamp, shady stamp dealers from scratching out the word false or covering it up with a, a fake cancellation. Um, and by doing that, they could pass off these facsimiles as real. Um, so it became kind of a, a war where um, the dealers would mark things out and then the Sith brothers would add like an overprint. And then they added a bigger overprint. And then they added like multiple overs, like they, they really tried to sell these as fakes. Uh, Richard Synth ran the Gerbuda Synth Company until his retirement in 1910. And then he passed the company off to his son-in-law, um, Heinrich Neb Neubauer. Uh, Louis Synth continued to sell stamps as the W.A. Synth and Company. Oh, I thought I took this one out. I'm sorry. Uh, the Spiro brothers, I guess I'll go ahead and talk about them. Uh, they were a printing company in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, Philip Spiro was the head of the company and they produced facsimiles for collectors. And they are believed to have produced facsimiles for over 500 different stamps, uh, possibly millions of copies of their facsimiles were printed. Uh, they were used to fill album spaces for many years, and they were a little less scrupulous than the Synth Brothers regarding how well their stamps were identified as fakes. Um, so here you can see um, a, an article in the Stamp Collectors magazine from 1864 talking about these stamps are fake. Um, and then they had a rebuttal the next month saying, uh, these are facsimiles and we do not sell fakes. We, we do not sell forgeries. We never claim that these are real, but it inspired a lot of philatelic backlash over facsimiles. Um, their facsimiles were printed from lithography, uh, usually in sheets of 25, and they were often canceled with large distinct hand stamps. So if you see fakes with some of the hand stamps I'm showing here, um, grids of dots or lines or ovals or circles, um, that's a kind of a sign that it might be a Spiro facsimile. Um, Hawaiian numeral forgeries, uh, they made a bunch of these. You can always tell the Spiro Hawaiian numeral forgeries by the broken E. You'll see that the top line of the E in Hawaiian postage has a little dent in it. Jean-Baptiste Moons. J.B. Moons was known as the Belgian Prince of Philately, and there's even a modern Belgian stamp issue with his portrait to celebrate his work. Uh, he became interesting in stamp collecting as a teenager. Around 1853, when he was 19, he began selling stamps out of his bookstore in Brussels, Belgium. Uh, he published his stamp, first stamp catalog in 1862, uh, Manual de Collectionneurs de Timbres Post, Handbook for Stamp Collectors. And he published a monthly journal called Le Timbre Post from 1863 until 1900. He did a lot of research into postage stamps, and he published quite a few different works regarding his studies on specific issues. He was not really a forger. He is often classified as one, but I don't think that's quite true. Because he never engraved any of the forgeries under his name himself, um, nor did he ever print them and sell them as fakes or forgeries. Uh, he worked with other philatelists to share information. Um, he published Charles Henry Coster's book of, um, in 1882, 
um, that book uses some of the same illustrations that Moon's used for his own publications. So he's not a stamp forger, but many forgeries are based on his illustrations. One of the first, he was one of the first stamp collectors, one of the first um, catalog makers to illustrate the stamps in the catalog. Uh, previously, a lot of these catalogs just had descriptions of the stamp. It's five cents, it's black, it has a portrait of um, whoever. But he actually published illustrations so that stamp collectors could see what they were looking for. And these illustrations were made by different lithographers. Um, uh, two of his engravers that we know for certain are Dramacher and Schmitz. But uh, later on when he worked with Henry Coster, they used a new forger or a new um, illustrator, a new engraver, and I do not know the name of that person. Um, So-called Moon's forgeries, they might be album cuts, just straight cut out of one of his publications. Um, they may be um, after Moon's forgeries, which other forgers copied his work. So if Moon's made a mistake in his illustration, um, these other forgeries will have that same mistake because they're based on it. And he sometimes unknowingly published bogus designs as real. Um, this is because a lot of the stamps that he based his illustration on, on he got in trades with other stamp dealers, um, especially regarding US locals, which he didn't have any easy access to because Belgium. So he had to rely on the information that he was given, and sometimes he was given information by forgers. George Hussey. George Hussey started selling stamps around 1856. He had an office in New York City. He was a successful stamp dealer, supposedly got the idea to start a private messenger service while working at the Bank of America, and he started that service in 1854. Um, he was offer, he offered a messenger express and small local post to his patrons, mostly circulars and bills. Um, but he created his own stamps to start selling in 1856. There are over 70 different real hussy stamps listed in the Scott catalog. This doesn't include his wrappers or labels. But philatelists have debated whether these are genuine stamps for delivery service or just philatelic designs to sell to collectors. He offered reprints of hard to find stamps. Uh, he bought the dies from US local posts when they went out of business. Um, many US local posts were very short lived, so a way that they could kind of recoup their losses was to sell the dies for their stamps to Hussey or to Scott. Um, and then he used them to make. Um, fakes to sell to collectors. And when he couldn't get the real dies, he had his engravers make new dies based on the original. Um, and he still marketed these as reprints, even though they did not use the original die. Um, Thomas Wood um, is his most well-known engraver that he worked with. Uh, he sold his operation to Robert Eason around 1873-1875. Uh, Eason kept the name Hussey for the stamp business. He worked with several engravers to print his stamps and forgeries. The most well-known is Thomas Wood. Um, we have a record of Wood's printing of some of Wood's printing records, but it is possible that he printed other forgeries as well not just the ones listed in his record. Um, Hussey printed stamps in multiples, um, many of which are still available in blocks or sheets. Um, sometimes he would put multiple, um, sometimes it'd be multiple of the same stamp, sometimes it'd be multiple of different stamps, as you can see in these in the, the photos I've shown. And he offered favor cancels. So if 
you came in with a stamp and you said, hey, cancel this for me, he would put his cancel on it. And he would put his cancel on stamps that weren't even his. Um, supposedly he said that he would honor any stamp brought to him. So if you brought a stamp from a different local post, he would deliver it with his little delivery service. And he provided stamps to other philatelic figures, such as Moons, um, supplying him stamps to include in his catalog. And sometimes he would supply forgeries, uh, resulting in inaccurate catalog illustrations. So supposedly, uh, William P. Brown, another New York stamp dealer, played a trick on Hussey by selling him genuine Essex Express stamps that he had doctored. So here is the Essex Letter Express stamp as it appears in um, Moon's 1864 catalog. Here is the doctored copy that, can you see this doctored copy? Oh, I gotta go back. Small technical difficulty there. No problem, looks yeah. good. <laughs> so he, he submitted this fake where he added the letters SX underneath the ship. And then Hussey rushed these um, fakes, these copies to Moons to sell them as real. And so then you can see on the other page here that uh, Moons also published this fake with the SX in his catalog. So you can see the, the development from the original, and I'll put original in quotations for Essex Letter Express, um, then the Brown's copy, and then it gets published in the Moons. John Walter Scott, known as the father of American philately. He was born in England in 1845 and began collecting stamps as a teenager. Moved to the United States in 1863 and he briefly traveled to California to participate in the gold rush. Uh, was unsuccessful, so he returned to his interest of stamps in New York City. He started three different stamp dealerships, all titled J.W. Scott Company. Second of these was sold off and became its own company independent of Scott. And um, when he opened his, that became the Scott Stamp and Coin Company. When he opened his third company, J.W. Scott Company, the independent company sold, they, they filed a copyright claim against him, but the court granted Scott the right to use his own name. Uh, he issued his first stamp price list in 1867, um, and then his the 16th edition of his price list is generally considered his first catalog um, that was published in 1868. He also started publishing the American Journal of Philately in 1868, and he would publish several other stamp and coin journals throughout his life. These include the Junior Weekly Letter, that encouraged trading between collectors and the Metropolitan Philatelist. He was an important figure uh, for inspiring and encouraging stamp collectors in North America. He published information, catalogs, and albums, but like Hussey, he tried to help collectors fill their albums by, re by producing reprints of hard to acquire stamps. Um, Scott made open advertisements, uh, looking for original dyes to use. Um, so you can see this card here, this postcard here that says, persons having plates, stones, dyes, electrotypes from any local or express post stamps, um, communicate with me. Um, but also he made some imitation dyes. Uh, later he renounced this practice. Uh, he realized that if he wanted to keep serious philatelist or philatelist who would be willing to spend big money with him active in the hobby, he needed to rebuild this trust in dealers. So he stopped making imitations and he actively shamed dealers who did make them, even his friends. 
Um, one example is Joseph J. Casey. He was a philologist who worked with Scott and was the editor of Scott's journal. And then in the 1870s, he, re he produced reprints of the Burford & Co. Express stamps, um, but they were imitations made from a new dye. And another collector found out that the reprints were not made from the genuine dyes, called Casey out in an article in a Boston stamp journal. And when Scott found out, he fired Casey and Casey took a major hit to his reputation. Scott forgeries are usually similar to the Scott illustrate, to the illustrations in the Scott albums. Um, they were printed on different papers, usually keeping the same color as the genuine examples. But some of the Scott forgeries are printed on stiff cream or white paper, and that is an identifier of it was likely a Scott forgery. Um, these forgeries were also printed sometimes in sheets or strips of multiple designs. Um, like the examples I'm showing. And then my favorite, my favorite bad boy of philately, Essa Allen, Samuel Allen Taylor. Samuel Allen Taylor was an infamous stamp form. He's sometimes called the leader of the Boston gang of forgers. He was born in Scotland. His parents died and at age 12, he was sent off to New York to live with an uncle. But he ran away from home and supposedly lived with a doctor who took him in for a few years. He worked as a messenger for some New York telegraph companies, and this is when he became interested in stamp collecting and U.S. local posts in particular, since he experienced their work personally. The first record we found of, stamp, of Taylor participating in a stamp-related scheme is this 1859 article from New York from a New York French language newspaper, Courier des Estats Unis. This article describes an 18 year old tailor arrest for selling hourly express post stamps, a bogus issue, supposedly to pay for a non existent newspaper. And Taylor is quoted in this article as calling the scheme a tax on the gullible. He had stamp dealerships in Montreal, Albany, and Boston. He sold packets of stamps, including his own forgeries and also other forgers' products, along with probably a few real stamps thrown in there to kind of make it look good. But he wasn't just a scoundrel. He did some good things for the hobby. For example, he published the Stamp Collector's Record starting in 1864 and running until 1876. This was the first stamp journal in North America. He was very knowledgeable about stamps, but for the good his journal did to spread awareness of philately, he also used it to cut his forgeries and to be pretty mean to other stamp dealers. In 1865, Taylor started selling bogus Baldwin's Railroad stamps. Another collector, named George Stewart Jr. figured out that these were a complete fantasy, so he called Taylor out in his journal, The Monthly Gazette. Taylor responded to that article by accusing Stewart of being the one who made the forgeries and tried to shame Stewart for tricking him. He called Stewart's journal the blowhard and he called Stewart some particularly nasty names. Quoting this article, down this blighted region is established a little postal stamp, postage stamp journal edited by a diminutive specimen of the blue nose of humanity, who, however well adapted to be a valuable acquisition to the department of Barnum's celebrated establishment devoted to the tap, to freaks of nature, he certainly mis did certainly mistake his mission on earth when he undertook the task of enlightening the timbrophilic world in the role of editor of a journal for which the time we shall designate by the characteristic title of the blowhard. Then after this, Taylor created an entirely new bogus stamp under the name Baldwin Railroad. 
and he claimed that his new fake was the real genuine stamp for the post. And he continued to sell both his new, the what he called genuine, and the previous fake, which he called the New Brunswick Manufacturer. He made forgeries of anything, um, but especially of US locals. He was responsible for many of the bogus or fantasy posts. Um, some of these fantasies like Baldwin Railroad were completely made up, but he also made fake stamps for real post offices that just didn't issue any stamps. He did know a lot about um, US locals and their postal history. He was quick to produce stamps from descriptions in, in stamp news so that he could be the first to sell them. And because these early descriptions um, didn't include illustrations, his first attempts looked different than what the genuine example appeared later. Um, so a good example is the Whittlefully Express stamps, which were described to have a central portrait and an oval with the name above and since below, but it wasn't described who the portrait was of, so Taylor just used the Bancroft Express um, portrait. Some of Taylor and Focus's are Frankenstein stamps. Um, they're stamps made by mashing up parts of different stamps. As I mentioned that the Whittlesley stamp used the portrait Taylor originally made for the Bancroft City Express stamp. Um, another example is the Albany Letter Express post. Um, this is a bogus, and you may recognize that the border of this stamp is made from a Pomeroy's Letter Express forgery, and then the central image, the eagle on the globe, is from a Boyd's um, post stamp forgery. Taylor often worked with other forgers and philatelists. He often worked with some local post owners to legitimize his fakes. So Taylor helped print the Westerbelt stamps, which were primarily philatelic. They were primarily meant to be sold to collectors and not really used for mail, um, but it was a real post. Um, it can be hard to tell who he actually worked with because Taylor used several fake names to peddle his stamps, so some forgers that he's been said to work with might not actually exist. They just might be him under another name. One of the forgers that we do know worked with Taylor is a dealer and publisher named Triffitt. Trefit uh, admitted to helping Taylor produce Hawaiian forgeries, and he later launched a campaign against Taylor that eventually resulted in his arrest, and Taylor's arrest when Taylor sold Cape of Good Hope forgery to another collector that Trefit warned. This arrest occurred in 1890, um, when Taylor was 50 years old. A newspaper report of the arrest notes that because he was caught forging foreign stamps, the punishment, punishment would be more severe than if he were caught with fakes of US stamps. All Taylor's dyes and supplies were taken and he probably stopped dealing stamps around this time. Note that this wasn't the first time Taylor was arrested or questioned by the government. Um, there were also news reports um, about Taylor dealing in used revenue stamps around the time that the government was cracking down on stamp reusage. Um, aside from stamps, Taylor participated in other scams or investments. He occasionally worked as a chemist and sold oils, like snake oils, at the Philadelphia World's Fair. He was also very skilled at advertising. Supposedly, he invented streetcar advertisements, mentioning the concept to a friend of his who was in the streetcar business as a way of earning extra money. Supposedly, this friend was the benefactor who took care of Taylor late in his life. Stamp forgeries. The Taylor stamp forgeries come in a wide variety of different colors and a wide, an even wider variety of different papers. He was very frugal and he just used whatever supplies he could get. If you see a stamp in an unusual color, it's probably a Taylor forgery. Um, his forgeries were usually typographed and printed in forms. Uh, these were arrangements of different stamps, dies printed in sheets. 
uh, this Flynn's penny post stamp that I am displaying uh, is a good illustration of a form because on the right side, you can see part of the border for that Bentley's dispatch forgery. So we know that these stamps were printed together. There are no known multiples of Taylor forgeries. He took great care to cut apart all of the stamps from their forms. So you might occasionally find part of a stamp on a Taylor forgery, like the example shown, but the closest thing to a multiple we have in our collection is an offset um, printing showing three different forgeries accidentally partially printed on the back of a stamp. And there we go. Uh, time for question and answer, and I will see if I can stop sharing my screen. Well, hold on, because there's a reference in contact. So, yeah, put that up. Yeah. And remember, friends, we have the, oh, hi, Frank Corwin, it's good to see you. Um, remember, you have that little option in your screen where you can screenshot it. So, yeah, put those back up there, DJ. Okay, cool. I am sorry for going over I, time. I tried to go as quick as I could, but. <laughs> yeah, you had a lot to cover. Now, I, I had seen James Gate. Did you have a question or were you, uh, I saw a hand at one point. No, okay. Friends, okay, so let's go ahead. Look in your your, your box, uh, CJ, because you're getting your accolades right now. Uh, those are always nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, and so does anybody want to ask something about, you know, of CJ, or do you have something that you'd like to share in terms of forgeries? Really? Well, I can share a few things that I have in the collection that I work on. Please do. Yeah, give a little uh, background, CJ, please, you know, for any of our friends who haven't met you yet, hon. You know, that you, you're a private researcher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I work at a private collection, um, and you can see my work with this collection on pennypost.org. Um, is where a lot of the work I've done on the carriers and locals is posted. Um, if you go to pennypost.org, they have an online reference collection, and you can see some of my work there. I just put that in the chat. Okay. Oh, that is a good question. Um, <laughs> Thanks, CJ. Uh, does, do you want to have him ask it himself? Yeah, I always forget if you have a, uh, a mic or not, hon. Go ahead. Go. I do. I do. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I inherited a stamp collection. I'm going through some worldwide stamps and um, came across a Montenegro set where um, it's very frequently forged, but the set itself is very low value. And so, um, and when I say frequently forged, I mean it was forged famously by a, a forger, a French forger. Um, and so it kind of made me question why the forger took the time to to forge these stamps to begin with. Um, and I don't know if you've seen any examples of this, um, maybe where the forger was contemporaneously forging stamps as opposed to looking back 50 years and um, forging stamps that, that he or she knew were valuable at that time. Yes, actually, um, a lot of these forgers that I've talked about, they did that. They forged these stamps that today we wouldn't think of as very expensive. Um, and even then they wouldn't think it's very, very expensive because they sold in packets. Uh, what they would do is they would offer, uh, they would advertise packet of worldwide or packet of um, the most recent uh, um, US or locals. And they would list the stamps that they had in there and you would buy it as a group, as a set. And some of those, like I said, might have a mix of some real things and they might have some fake things. Rather than go out and get worldwide stamps, it was easier just to print them here because they would just stick them in this packet and they would sell the packet as a group. And that's why there was a lot of these. It was contemporary at the time that they forged it and they were just selling them in, in groups that gave them more value um, rather than the, selling the stamp itself. Does that make Got sense? It. Yeah, no, absolutely. I appreciate it. And great, great presentation. Thank you. As per usual. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. You want to show our, your, what you were going to do, CJ? 
Were you going to share something? Oh, um, so when I talked about um, Thomas Wood, which was Hussey's engraver, uh, we have here, this is his log. Um, this is what it looked like, his printing record. Wow. And you can see that he put a forgery, a forgery that he made and then listed details about how, when it was printed and how many. Um, the problem that we have with this book is that it has been passed around through collectors through the years. So we do have a slight concern that perhaps some of these forgeries were taken off and replaced through the time, but it does give us a good sense of when different forgeries were made and um, how many were issued. Um, so this is an incredibly great thing that um, the owner of the collection I work with bought in an auction not too long ago. Um, and we're really excited about it because before we had this in the collection here, uh, we only had like a black and white photocopy of it. And then this, it's much better to research this. So, um, I have a couple, so here's an early Scott's catalog. You can see what I mean by these illustrations. Today, the Scott catalog will have like a picture of the stamp, um, you know, and color and pretty, but but they used to just have these illustrations that they had to make themselves. Here is the catalog of William P. Brown. That's the guy that made the fake Essex stamp. Um, so this is, uh, it was published by a stamp collector James Leslie, but it is, it's just a copy of Moon's work that was posted under a different name, and it only has the United States stamps. Here is the catalog of the Simph Brothers. Um, I, I like the illustrations that they published in theirs. They were very good illustrators and engravers. Um, Here is our copy of one of the Moon's books. Uh, this is the catalog from 83, uh, 1883. Uh, and again, like absolutely beautiful illustrations, stamps from many countries. Uh, I, around this time last year, I was so, so excited. Uh, I visited Belgium and I went to the location that his store, his bookstore was. And I got to stand next to the door of his bookstore. Um, it was an art gallery when I visited, but uh, I was so excited. It was like going back in time. Um, I'm, I love, forgers and what they did uh, for for early philately. Obviously, modern there's modern forgers and there are still a lot of forgeries up on eBay. So do be careful um, when you are buying things. I think that there's no problem with forgeries or facsimiles as long as they are identified as such. I think that there are people who make really creative fake covers. Um, that are interesting to look at and they're, they're fun art pieces, but you have to be careful and know they need to be uh, specifically labeled that this is fake, this is a facsimile, um, this is an art piece. And in those cases, they're very fun. Um, it's just that some people get taken advantage of. Uh, I recommend that if you ever come across something on eBay, that looks like a modern fake, a uh, simile, an art project, please go into the questions to the seller of the eBay listing and ask, is this real? Or do you know this isn't real? Mm -hmm. um, some people who are selling fakes, they're not doing it to be mean or to scam you. They're doing it because they don't know themselves. So if you ask that in the eBay questions, it will show up for other people searching. Oh. And then more people can be aware. Oh, that's a great hint. Um, 
while you speak, Casey, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, friends, so uh, so you can have a look at what Scott Tiffany from the APRL curated for you all to have a look at in case this is something that you'd like to pursue further for references. And I'll scroll down. But go ahead, CJ. Excuse me. Oh, um, I I have some uh, modern voguses here that are when I talk about uh, modern art pieces, modern fakes. Some of these are very funny. Um, here's a stamp that was sold on eBay. Roswell, New Mexico, special delivery. You can see it's a little alien. Oh wow. So he's, there's some fun things. Where did you? Uh, I would love to. These these were on eBay, and I would love to be able to find the person who made them. I have done digging, and I have emailed several people. Like, is this you? Because I want to know who made these. These are great. Um. So let's see what's another fun one. Here, I like this one a lot. Uh, Santa Claus, Indiana, postage due. <laughs> That's cute. Well, you, now you're starting so, to speak some of my language because in the mail art world, there's some people, you know, that are so good at artist stamps. They see if they can't get it through the mail. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they can. Um, Sometimes they can. Sometimes they can. I have. Um, so these are some modern counterfeits. Um, these were actually sold to be used as postage um, by people who actually tried to pass these out as real stamps. They're actually kind of easy to tell that they're fake. They have a gloss on them next to a real stamp you would be able to see. But I think that mo one of the most obvious things is they have this like die cut um, that the on the back that the uh, the real ones don't have. So there are fakes out there. <laughs> um, if you guys want to contact me about fakes and forgeries, um, you can. Check out my Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Philately Things, um, and that's an easy way to get a hold of me. Um, but if you want to send an email, it is email is a little complicated. Casey dot White at conceptsindustrial dot com, and I'll put that in the chat. I got it. I got it. I'm right behind you. All right, and uh, so. But that's a way you can contact me if you have any questions about fakes and forgeries. Again, most of my work is on U.S. forgeries, um, U.S. carriers and locals especially, but general U.S. forgeries, um, Hawaiian forgeries. Uh, but so if you have a question about something from another country, I might not be the best person to contact, but I'll try my best to direct you in the right direction. You're always so helpful, CJ. Thank you. And I, you know, Kurt Streepy's very much into Hawaii, the Hawaii. So maybe at some point you guys talk about that. He'll be talking about first uh, issues on Hawaii soon. And speaking of coming up on Friday, that's our next chat. Thank you, CJ, so much for this discussion. Please, before we leave the conversation, I do want you to look at your chat and and you know, swim in all the compliments. You you really helped uh, light people up today, like a pinball machine, which is always our mission here on Stamp Chat. We we really enjoy illuminating uh, curiosity and satisfying that. So thank you for a, another great presentation on Friday. We will have the Punk Philatelist, and you he's here on the call today. Hi Gerard, thank you. It's five o'clock. Hi Heidi, hello everyone. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. He'll be presenting Collecting Modern Stamps the Hard Way, an intro to collecting commercial covers. So that will be fun. And I hope that everybody will join us for that call. That will be at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern on Friday. Frank Corwin, good to see you too. Jack Chang, 
all the way from London. Thank you so much for joining the call, friends. And um, remember, expertizing is one of the services that we have for the American Philatelic Society. And you all are familiar with uh, Mr. Gary Lowe. He's the director of expertizing. And he's another great fella to, you know, bend his ears about fakes and forgeries, et cetera, et cetera. So I think maybe we'll have, maybe we'll do a, a, a co a co-host thing between you, CJ, and Gary. I think that would be fun. But uh, hope everybody's well. If you have any ideas for Stamp Chats or if you want to present, then please let me know. Drop me an email, Heidi at stamps.org. And um, that'd be, sorry, I just looked at the chat. Um, no, I did not <laughs> in, the, in the private. Uh, so anyway, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you. Check out stamps.org. We got a lot of great member benefits. Be sure to share your friends. We need 2020. Thanks so much, CJ. Bye, everybody. Frank Corwin, Bye. get much. I still want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, okay, CJ. Bye, Jack Jang. So good to see you. Bye, Gerard. Okay, thank you. Okay, seven o'clock. Heidi, it's Bye, everybody. Okay. See you All right. Bye, bye. Thank you. Lloyd Nutter, send me an email. <laughs> <laughs>